Good early evening from uh, Aalto University School of Business. I apologize for the little delay. We had some technical difficulties, but now we're online. Thank you very much for your patient, uh, patience waiting for us there. Um, so welcome to this evening's episode of Better Business, Better Society uh, seminar series. Uh, as you already noticed, we're going to be running in English this time. And during the spring, we're going to be alternating between English and Finnish uh, seminars. Um, and uh, as our tradition has been, uh, I will cover just a few small uh, points on what's going on here at School of Business. And then um, I, I let uh, the word over to the seminar. So, so briefly on the school uh, update, the first item there is really something I would rather uh, quit uh, repeating soon. We are still living Corona times and we are still doing all our, um, most of our education online. Uh, right now at Alto, we have made a firm commitment to continue online teaching at least until middle of April. And of course, the time will show uh, where we're at at that point of time, we are all eagerly waiting to get back into uh, the normal mode of teaching, of course. Uh, one big thing that we made a decision here in early January is we had the uh, doctoral conferment, which happens at the School of Business every five years, that was scheduled for May 21. And uh, we have made a decision to push that forward uh, one year for obvious reasons. Um, we have had some celebrations here already. Our school actually turned 110 years old on January 16th. We will be celebrating that throughout the year. Obviously, Corona limits a little bit on what we can do right now, but, but it will be visible throughout the year in what we do and hopefully um, uh, towards the fall, uh, we can also meet uh, in person with all of you and uh, celebrate our 110 years. Part of the uh, celebration for us is also we have kicked off a fundraising campaign. Uh, we started that um, a, a little over a week ago and uh, I can report that the response has been great. Uh, you, you, may, uh, you, you do get some notes on that in the, in the uh, mails that are related to this as well. And uh, what we're trying to do with fundraising is not only obviously uh, strengthen the capital base of our school in order to, to uh, grow and prosper uh, well into the future, but we also want to increase our number of donors so every 10 euros uh, is as welcome as larger donations. Um, if you have any questions or wonderings about the donations or fundraising campaign, you can send me email directly, first name dot last name at alto dot fi. Um, uh, bit of an update on our operations too before we move on with the seminar. Um, we have been talking about how we have really uh, exceeded expectations on, on our, on our um, performance when it comes especially on research. And now it looks like our, our um, international pool is really increasing quite rapidly. We have uh, already during this January, we've had the deadlines for applications for uh, English speaking bachelor's programs and master's programs and also a doctor program. And all the numbers are uh, showing great increases. Uh, so, so things are looking up. We have a lot of work to shift through the applications, but that is, some, that is work that we want to do. And it's great to see that we have a lot of uh, good quality applicants who want to come from all, the, all over the world. Um, but that's in short what's going on here at school. Um, now we're gonna move over to our seminar and our speaker to, tonight doesn't need uh, any uh, further representations. It's Ex Esko Aho, who is our uh, executive in residence, and of course, also former prime minister and many other things. Uh, I'm not gonna spend the seminar time on going over that, but I'll let Esko take over, so please. Thank you so much and uh, Good, good evening on my behalf as well. Uh, in spite of the fact that we are a bit late, I, I assume that we can, we can conclude around six o'clock, maybe 
a bit after that, but, uh, but let's have a look. Uh, first of all, I, I, I'd like to say that I'm really privileged when looking back my, my personal history. I'm, I'm one of those few uh, political leaders, at least in Finland, who have had an opportunity to leave politics and to move to business and also to have a lot of experience from academic life not only here in Finland, but in, in some, some uh, uh, other countries as, as well. I think it has been one of the best experiences of my life to have an opportunity to, to let's say, to, to get, get rid of these obstacles, uh, rather substantial obstacles between these sectors. And it has helped me to, to understand the logic of uh, doing decisions and, uh, and, uh, uh, and operating uh, business uh, in different uh, sectors of the society. And uh, I'm very happy that uh, Aalto University has put and is going to put more emphasis on relationship between business and government or business and society. I assume that uh, this uh, present crisis is going to stress the importance of uh, collaboration between these two sectors, better understanding between these two. When uh, I was sitting uh, on the political side and working on the political side, I quite often recognized that as a politician uh, we had a tendency to know better than business leaders how business decisions should be, should be, should be done. Uh, we were very eager and politicians today as well are very eager to give guidance for politicians what to do and what not to do, how to make profit and uh, how to avoid mistakes in, in, in business. Uh, and uh, in the same way, on the business side, business leaders quite often are giving advice for politicians how to do right things in, in, in uh, politics, uh, how to run the government in a way that uh, consequences and results are going to be as uh, uh, good as possible. Unfortunately, both are wrong. Both do have uh, difficulties to understand that logic of decision making is not the same on the public side and on the on the private side. Uh, we have a uh, we have a lot of common. We have a uh, we have a uh, common interest. We have uh, common factors uh, of uh, success as well. But uh, there are some fundamental differences as well. In my opinion. The most, maybe the most fundamental difference is that on the, on the governmental side, uh, your responsibility is universal. If and when you have to do some critical decisions to cut spending or to limit the role of the government, and uh, in that way to save, uh, save resources, the fact is that quite often and quite easily uh, challenges are coming through another door, uh, cutting, for example, some social security costs. The risk is that another programs will, be, will need more resources after cuts made. So this universal responsibility is something which is not relevant for business leaders. In business, if you have to cut costs and to get better balance between your costs and uh, revenues, uh, you can easily make a plan for next two years, and after two years, your your your, your savings are there. Sometimes, uh, those savings will lead e extraordinary costs for the for the public sector. So that is something we have to keep in our mind when we speak about business and society and collaboration between business and society. Roles uh, are different. Objectives are a bit different as well, and especially the logic of uh, operations are, are different. But there are good reasons to collaborate. It's very important to understand the logic of decision making. And uh, in the future, I'm confident we need more and more collaboration between business and uh, governmental institutions and business and society as a, as a whole. When looking back, back the history, uh, I have a quote uh, uh, from uh, 1953. Uh, General Motors uh, 
CEO Charles E. Wilson told uh, uh, a Senate uh, committee in 1953, he said, for years I taught that what was good for our country was good for General Motors and uh, vice versa. And that was, that was the expectations until 1960s. In a way, business people were able to believe that if business is doing well, it's good for the society. And if society was operating well, you, you were able to expect that it's good for, for business as well. But in the 1960s, we started to recognize more and more challenges coming from the fact that, that new technologies and uh, global businesses were not producing only positive things, but there were more and more critical issues coming as well. Uh, we were concerned about, about, about limits of resources, uh, pollution became on the agenda, and questions related with uh, human rights uh, were also included into the, into the business discussion as, as well. And, uh, and we were able to see that we were moving from, like I would like to say, from first generation of uh, corporate social responsibility or corporate responsibility into the second generation. The first generation was more or less based on charity. Uh, companies uh, had a role to play uh, to support uh, social activities, especially local social activities, and they were doing that uh, from their profits, not having any idea how those investments uh, or those donations will promote business itself. It was like a, a prom promotion of uh, brand and promotion of, uh, of, of, of the fact that uh, business is is uh, doing good for, for the society. But companies doing that did not have any, any major objectives to promote their own businesses. But uh, because of those developments I mentioned, those negative consequences of uh, business, which were more and more visible in the public debate, companies started to consider how they will be more effective in uh, in mitigating those risks and those negative consequences of technologies and, and businesses. And corporate social responsibility programs were the conclusion they, they made. They decided to start investing in uh, programs which were promoting and supporting local communities, especially local communities, in preventing negative trends in the society and negative consequences of, of uh, business and uh, use of technologies in, in societies. And uh, those uh, programs were helping companies to create brand value. And they were like certain kind of insurance for, for companies that they were able to, 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 to secure uh, certain support for, for their business. But there were a couple of weaknesses in these programs. First weakness was that, that uh, the impact of these uh, uh, corporate social responsibility programs, uh, consequences or, or, or consequences of these programs were rather, rather, rather limited. Secondly, they were not integrated into the strategic decisions made in, in the company. And thirdly, uh, feedback to the company was rather limited. They did not give any strong contribution to the business, original business of the, of the, of the company. Uh, typically, companies used uh, uh, their own products and services, primarily their own products and services for these corporate social uh, responsibility programs. And secondly, they also tried to evaluate their own own operations as well. Uh, the sustainability uh, rankings and indexes were developed in order to give companies certain kind of guidance how well they were performing among, among uh, other companies uh, in, in this area. That was the case uh, until 2000, more or less, maybe even, even later than that. But then 
uh, especially after 2011, we have got uh, a new type of approach, which is which has uh, got a rather substantial amount of uh, attention, a lot of discussion as well. But to be honest, I, I've not seen yet uh, that much consequences of this new approach. And it's called uh, shared value thinking. I joined Nokia's management team in 2008, late 2008, and uh, since the beginning of 2009, I had responsibility of uh, Nokia's uh, uh, governmental relations and uh, also corporate social responsibility programs. And uh, when I joined Nokia, I didn't understand how challenging times we are going to face. And the most challenging was uh, that radical transformation company has to, has to do. And uh, one day, exactly 10 years ago, uh, this document or this uh, magazine came to my table at the Nokia's headquarters close to this place. It was a Harvard Business Review, uh, 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 which was uh, having a, a major or leading article about how to fix capitalism. And the writer, uh, writers of this article were, uh, uh, were um, Michael Porter and Mark Kramer. I learned to know Michael Porter uh, a few years earlier. Uh, I can say that I was a friend of his and I had been working at his office as well later on. And, uh, and that's why I wanted to read this article, in order to understand what uh, Michael Porter, with his colleague, what they wanted to say. And his message uh, in this article was uh, actually rather simple, but big ideas are quite often rather simple. Uh, and, and the idea was based uh, on the fact that, that uh, social and societal problems had become much more complicated uh, uh, early 2000s. We had uh, environmental challenges, uh, climate change was coming rapidly, very high on the agenda of all nations uh, in the, or, and governments in the, in the world. Secondly, uh, aging of population as well, which is rather complicated challenge as, as well. That was uh, becoming huge, huge uh, uh, issue on the uh, agenda of uh, governments in, developed, uh, in the developed world, especially. Thirdly, there were a lot of uh, discussion about, about the role of business, and more and more critical uh, aspects were, uh, were expressed. The financial crisis of 2008-2009, uh, uh, which required huge investments in banking sector, uh, in order to, to, to guarantee that the bank financial system will work, it created a lot of critical, uh, critical uh, uh, views on, on the role of capitalist uh, system and the consequences of, consequences of uh, governmental interventions made. Uh, that was one aspect. So, so societal problems became more complex and more complicated and uh, Kramer and uh, Porter explained that, that without having access to the best resources, best talents and best skills of the private sector, uh, governmental institutions and governments cannot uh, find sustainable solutions. It's impossible to, to mitigate those risks and to find solutions into our problems without having private sector contribution. A strong contribution as well. And the, on the other side of the, of the angle, uh, if you look at uh, the companies, uh, Porter and Kramer came to the conclusion that, that on the longer term, companies cannot uh, have a profitable business if the society around them is not healthy. That is, a, that is an issue which is not very clear for, for companies, uh, maybe even, even, even today. There are companies who believe that, all right, our, our business environment is not very healthy, but uh, as a global business, global companies, we can, we, can, we can survive. 
But uh, the fact is that, uh, that uh, more and more challenges are coming and uh, even the biggest companies, uh, global companies, have to recognize that without sound, healthy societies around them, it's very, very complicated and difficult to make good business. Uh, I read uh, a couple of years ago, oh, it's more than two, maybe three, four years ago, I read an article in the New York Times saying that five uh, biggest platform companies, Amazon, uh, Apple, uh, Google, Facebook, and uh, Microsoft, uh, they have uh, one single common enemy. According to the article, that common in enemy was government. I don't believe that if you ask these companies today, they don't give that message anymore. After, after what has happened since that, even those five major companies, by the way, having, having roughly one quarter of the, of the, of the uh, stock market in the U.S., so these five companies, their, uh, their, their uh, market cap uh, is uh, roughly, total market cap is roughly 25% of the, of the total in the U.S. Uh, uh, Dow Jones index. But anyway, these companies are not able to say anymore, government is our biggest enemy, because they have recognized that uh, in these circumstances, they have to work together with governments in order to, 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 to have a profitable business on the, on the longer term. I will return back to this future aspect after speaking about what consequences this uh, article had in our company at Nokia 2011. It's a good example how simple, clear ideas do have a rather radical consequences when applied on the company level. 2011, exactly in the same time when this uh, magazine came out, we had to approve new strategy for Nokia. Nokia's mobile phone business was making huge losses and com company, company has to decide what kind of strategy it will apply in order to get uh, that business to survive on the longer term. And we came to the conclusion that Nokia should start collaboration with Microsoft and uh, that led to a, a, a radical change in, uh, in uh, employment at Nokia. In the early 2011 strategy decision, we agreed that we should cut 10,000 jobs uh, globally and uh, four or 5,000 jobs here in Finland alone. That was a radical change, radical move, and we had to understand what to do, how to mitigate those reputational risks and business risks related to that cut of uh, employment uh, at Nokia. And uh, we had one major message in our mind when this uh, program was started. Uh, 2008, Nokia had to close a factory in Germany and uh, consequences of that decision to close the Bochum factory were disastrous. Reputational damage, but also financial damage was huge for, for Nokia. It was very expensive exercise for, for Nokia. And, uh, and both the political, political decision makers, uh, trade unions and public opinion in Germany was, uh, was uh, extremely, extremely aggressive against Nokia and Nokia's operations. And finally, Nokia made a deal, but it was, as I mentioned, it was expensive deal and also reputational damage was huge for Nokia because of that. And uh, we were told, when we started to analyze what to do next, we were told, no more Bochum. No more Bochum. I don't think that Nokia made that many fundamental mistakes when Bochum decision was made. It was necessary to be done, uh, financial reasons, technological reasons to make that decision were obvious, but it was more 
about communication and the way how that decision was, was, was made. It was not based on shared value thinking. It was based on the idea that we were doing global business and government in Germany and public opinion in Germany has to be able to understand what does it mean to have a global business and to play according to the global rules. Unfortunately, they were not able to understand that and Nokia was not able to communicate that well for, for the German decision makers and public opinion. Partly because they were trying to say, unfortunately, our role is over, we are moving this problem and giving it now for you. So we expected that after closing the, the factory, government of Germany and German decision makers will take care of the rest. We started to consider how can we do this in a, in a new way. And we started to read carefully this article here, and we came to the conclusion that now Nokia has to do shared value-based program. And we, we got, I, I met the CEO of, uh, of Nokia after um, the, the board of directors decision was made. Next morning, extremely and very early in the morning, I, I met Mr. Uh, Mr. Elop, and I said, I have a few ideas what we can do. So we had closed one factory in, uh, or one site actually, not factory, but one site in Juvescula 2008, and uh, we, rec or actually 2009, and we recognized that, that actually with good collaboration with stakeholders, we were able to get that outcome to be positive, not only for, for stakeholders or the local community, but for Nokia as well. So we tested certain ideas at Juvascula, and uh, I had an idea that we should do that now globally. And we created a small, I got licensed to have a small group of, uh, or small team with a strategy team of, of Nokia to design a re-employment program for Nokians, those 10,000 people who were losing their jobs. And uh, we, we tried to do clear strategy. What does it mean to do that in a different way? And our idea of shared value thinking was that, that we have to set clear priorities. How, what are our preferences when we are trying to get this transformation to happen? And we made few fundamental priority decisions. For the first, we decided that we need a special entity, a special program to get rid of this uh, re-employment. Because uh, management team of Nokia had a lot of uh, efforts to be done in uh, business transformation itself. So we need a specialized team to take care of, of this re-employment program. Secondly, we, had, we set three different priorities. First priority was to support Nokians who lost their jobs. Secondly, we decided that we want to support those communities which were suffering both from closing sites or, or limiting or, or reducing resources at, at sites. And for the third, we wanted to create a model which will promote Nokia's own business as well. But that was third priority. I went to Boston or, or Cambridge to meet Mr. Porter, Michael Porter, uh, in February uh, 2011. I introduced to him our ideas, and he said, Esko, this is a good program as such, but your priorities are not right. You should put Nokia's own business to be priority number one, and then re-employment number two, and uh, support for local communities number three. We didn't follow his advice. We decided to keep our original plan, and afterwards, Michael Porter agreed that our decision was exactly correct. Uh, I don't want to go into the details, but, but I think the best example, uh, or the, or the best evidence, how well that program worked, it was called later on Nokia Bridge, Bridge program, how well it worked. The, the, the good example of that is that no one even even speaks about job losses thanks to Nokia's 
transformation. And, uh, and uh, 60 percent of all Nokians were able to be re-employed before they left the company, before they closed the door at Nokia. And uh, secondly, local communities, all local communities uh, were able to, to survive in spite of this, uh, these uh, cuts. Thirdly, more than 1,000 new companies were created thanks to that program. And, uh, and uh, finally, uh, Nokia's transformation story worked quite well. Uh, Harvard Business Re uh, School made a study and a case of this uh, Nokia's bridge program later on. Uh, Pro Professor Sandra Sacher, who was responsible for this and who has been teaching this case at uh, business school, she said that thanks to Nokia's program, she has uh, seen one very special case, exceptional case. Those responsible for transformation of the company were able to concentrate into that. And those responsible for, for layoff uh, of uh, uh, consequences and uh, re-employment program were able to do their own job well. Division of labor worked well and that guaranteed that Nokia's transformation ha happened uh, well uh, with uh, rather rapid uh, consequences in Nokia's business as, as well. Nokia was able to recover and uh, transform uh, quite, quite, uh, quite nicely without major crises after these, these uh, uh, cuts. So, if you look back this transformation, you can say that, yes, Nokians, those losing their jobs, were able to get benefits from that. It was good for local communities, and it was good for Nokia's business as well. Shared value principle was, was uh, realized. Finally, I'd like to say a few words about the future. Why I'm a strong believer in the idea that shared value thinking is the only option to guarantee that both democracies and market economies will be able to survive and to become competitive on the, on the longer term. Because, because uh, technological change, which is going on, is also going to, to challenge the, the, this, this uh, collaboration model. In spite of the fact that some big companies are saying that we can do this on our own, we don't need governments, the fact is that in many areas of, of uh, technological transformation, uh, especially when looking at uh, high-tech uh, applications, uh, governments are needed. It doesn't mean that governments have to control or governments should be leading the process, but we need certain kind of guidance or guiding principles how technologies will be applied. We need a certain number of standards. We need also governmental support for innovation, funding for research and development and, and innovation. We need uh, certain kind of safety and security rules. Data protection is a critical issue f f in, the, in the future. And you cannot imagine that data protection can be taken care of by companies only. Governmental contribution or governmental contributions are urgently needed for that. Uh, and and that's, that's one reason why collaboration is needed. The same with, uh, with, uh, with uh, educational investments. Uh, if you want to get uh, right kind of skills and talents, uh, it cannot happen without governmental contributions. And then, finally, when looking at, uh, when looking at uh, uh, those negative consequences of technologies, pollution uh, or sustainability challenges, the fact is that, that uh, business and government have to work together. And we have to be able to show to uh, public opinion uh, and individual people that, that this collaboration is able to get things to happen faster. I'm a strong believer in technologies. When looking at environmental challenges of ours, I'm not believing that we can 
and I don't, don't trust that we can we can limit uh, operations of business or or, or or consumer behaviors in a way that we can protect our our, our globe and our environment. The only option is that we rapidly develop new technologies which will help us to find ways and means to move into rapidly into sustainable way of production and consumption. And I can see a lot of uh, indications that that can happen. Is it going to happen fast enough? That is a good question, but we have potential to do that. Good example is, is discussion about hydrogen now, for example. All governments in the world, especially the United States and, and Europe, the European Union, are going to spend billions and billions to uh, recover from this crisis. Money has to be spent in a, in a wise way. Uh, and one of those investments we urgently need is, is investment for the future energy production uh, options and uh, models, which will make it possible to move to carbon-free production of energy as soon as possible. So also in that area, I can see need for shared value thinking and practical applications of shared value thinking. And finally, why is it so difficult? One thing is, is uh, lack of, uh, let's say, lack of conceptual approach. We need new kind of concepts how business and government should work together. Good example is what is going on with uh, the European Union recovery funding, for example. Governments are doing their plans, they are asking contributions from, from the business, but the, the, the model is, in my opinion and in my eyes, it is rather old-fashioned. You cannot do that in silos. You have to have a conce conceptual understanding how to do this uh, transformation, how to spend this, this huge amount of money in a way that it is in a maximum way promoting uh, tr uh, transformation of our economies and our societies. And the critical question is not how to spend or, or where to spend this money, but how to spend it in a way that we can get multipliers, multipliers coming from the private sector. And hydrogen is a good example of areas where this, these multipliers can be very high. It means that business companies do have urgent interest to participate in these programs and to be leading, in a way, these programs as well. When Finland was recovering from, from the crisis early 1990s, I think we made at least one thing in a correct way. We decided that in spite of all the challenges and all the problems we had, in spite of the fact that we had to cut, cut almost all the costs of, uh, of uh, public sector, we decided R&D spending must be increased. And uh, that increase was based on private sector initiatives. We were, we were not trying to force companies to do something, but we were able to give funding uh, uh, we were matching uh, funding that was made by government, uh, by, by companies themselves. So companies took the risk and governmental funding was promoting and supporting that risk taking. And I think that was the best model to get results. So that business risk and governmental contribution were nicely integrated into one. And by the way, if you look at the 1990s and the Finland's, Finland's success story in the 1990s, the fact is that there was one third component as well. Finland in the 1990s was the most successful country in the world, having business, government and university or research institution collaboration. Universities and uh, research institutions made huge contribution to transformation story of Finland in the 1990s. That's why what I'm saying when I'm speaking about business and society, business and government collaboration, I think that this aspect, academic aspect, has to be integrated into that as well. All right, I'm 
I'm used maybe my time now, and uh, I hope that there are some questions or comments coming from the from the audience as as well. Hopefully, hopefully somebody has something to ask. I can I can take a couple of questions now, or otherwise we are going to continue for a while speaking. No questions there. All right, maybe I will, I will go forward. But if you have any questions, don't hesitate to 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 to, to make them. I'm very happy to 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 answer the questions. But I'd like to take one step forward. What is the what is the foundation of of uh, this new concept we need? How to promote maximum? use of uh, technologies, uh, especially in a country like, like Finland. For the first, when looking back, quite often discussion about research and development investments is based on the idea that we have been comparing Finland's resources and Finland's capacities with the United States, uh, major European countries or China and others. And conclusion is that, unfortunately, our resources are limited. We have, uh, we have not enough, enough uh, funding for certain specific programs, and we are far away from, from, the, world, from the world top. I, I'm not speaking in, against investments in, in this, uh, like I, what to call them, technology verticals. We need to invest in, invest in uh, technology verticals, uh, but uh, we have lot of limit, limits and limitations in, in that area. Maybe the best method for us to survive in that game is to work together with other European countries or European Union countries. The European Union has much, much more capacity than it has been able to utilize until now. We have to make Euro the European Union stronger player in the, the global competition in the field of uh, science and technology. Now there is a question. Yes, there is a question. Have you seen these conceptual transformation decisions taken? And uh, meaning how to allocate the EU support? Uh, I have seen a lot of reports made uh, how to change the system in Europe. Uh, the most impressive one was made in 2000, and actually two, yeah, 2000 when when the European Union decided that it would become the most competitive region in the world, uh, that Lisbon strategy uh, approval. And then two years later, the European Union decided that R&D spending should be, should, be on the, uh, should be raised on the level of, to the level of 3% uh, of GDP. Uh, there were impressive decisions made, but unfortunately nothing happened. 2010, that was the target year. 2010, the European Union was roughly on the same level as it was in 2000 when these strategies were approved. So the European Union has been very good in producing programs. I have been also involved. Uh, we made uh, a report. I was chairing a small group of specialists, and we made a report for the European Union called Creating Innovative Europe. Uh, again, uh, I, I think it was a good report. We spoke about the idea how to use public procurement policies in promoting innovation, uh, how to make certain kind of uh, uh, target sectors where, where to invest especially and so on. But uh, very few, if any, of these recommendations have ever been realized. So European, the European Union has been good in designing strategies, but extremely weak in, uh, in executing them. And I think one reason for that is that that uh, that uh, uh, that we have not relied on market forces. For example, if you look at digital sector today, uh, we are lagging behind in a massive way compared to the United States and China as well. All the major players in digital sector, except uh, telecom uh, network business, where Nokia and uh, Ericsson are leading companies in the world, but in all other sectors, Europe is lacking behind. And it's not because of lack of investments, but it's uh, more 
because lack of uh, markets. We didn't have, and we don't even have today, uh, a digital single market, in spite of the fact that we have made a lot of decisions to create that. So that's my conclusion. I've seen a lot of attempts, but unfortunately, uh, very few uh, success stories and well-executed uh, programs. Then there's another question. Um, if we are going to upgrade cooperation between academia, business and governments, uh, what kind of experience and skills should we develop for these exper experts uh, that can do this? I think, uh, and it's a very good question because it's, it, it was, it's, it's an answer which is closely linked to what I just said before the first question came. I was uh, trying to say that, that in the future this, this uh, vertical game is uh, partly lost from, from the European Union perspective. Unfortunately, when looking at certain, certain critical technology sectors, the fact is that the United States and China have been investing are, and are investing that much that it's very difficult to imagine that Europe is able to, 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 to be competitive with them. But there is another game. This is this uh, horizontal game where you have to apply different technologies and integrate these different technologies in, a, in an efficient way uh, together and also to assist to increase productivity in the traditional sectors. And that game is still going on. And, and uh, you cannot say that Chinese or, or Americans have won. We still have a lot of opportunities there. And I'd like to call it ecosystem game. Everything is going to be dependent on how good ecosystem you are able to create for applications. Think about, uh, for example, about artificial intelligence. How to use artificial in intelligence it, it, it doesn't require only technological skills and technological capacities, but a lot of uh, managerial capacities, uh, even humanities are needed in order to get maximum out of that. If you look at healthcare system, for example, I think this uh, European model of healthcare will be able to absorb artificial intelligence much better than, than the, the American system. We have a lot of assets, but, but in order to get uh, benefits from technologies, we have to be able to, to, to create that ecosystem and to open door for innovation uh, to take place. And unfortunately, like we have seen in Finland when we have tried to do this social and, uh, and health reform, it has taken 10-15 years and failure after failure. In spite of the fact that everyone understands that we need that reform, not because of uh, making immediate savings or or, or immediate, to have immediate results, but open door for, for innovation in this sector. But many uh, politicians do not at all understand that uh, reform is needed in order to get benefits from technologies. They have something else on their agenda. We had one excellent example in Europe uh, from 1980s, late 1980s, where we succeeded in business and government collaboration, and academia was involved in there as well, and that was GSM standard. Mobile revolution was taking place and started uh, in the 1980s, and Europe was clever enough to understand that now we have to, we have to make a common understanding and common decision, what are the guidelines for that business to be developed? And GSM standard was approved in Copenhagen 1987, and that gave guidelines for Nokia, Ericsson, Siemens and others, how to, what kind of investments to do in that sector. And at the same time we opened the markets, we make, made market reforms thanks to, sing, thanks to single market program which was just executed. By the way, single market, market program is the last e efficiently executed European Union level uh, reform made. Anyway, we made it and, and uh, thanks to that in the 1990s, uh, Europe was the best place in the world to, to make uh, uh, mobile technology products and solutions. Unfortunately, we lost that position uh, later on, not because of uh, weaknesses of that 1990 system, but unfortunately we, were not, we didn't have capacity to, to integrate, integrate uh, digital content 
and uh, software capacities into, into that mobile technology capacity we had. And that led to the situation that US and um, Silicon Valley uh, took, uh, took lead, lead in that and, uh, and uh, Europe lost mobile, certain, certain part of its mobile uh, technology assets. But again, as I said, if we are able to create right kind of ecosystems, we can take back at least part of that competitiveness. In certain areas, Europe has huge assets. And then... There is a bit uh, longer question. So, um, what are the key challenges in creating the single digital market in EU or creating the innovation ecosystem you just uh, mentioned? So, why has there been so few success cases or even taken so long despite it seems like everyone is uh, talking, hyping uh, about this nowadays? Uh, and do you have any suggestions on uh, what can be done better? Uh, we were quite close to get uh, a breakthrough in creating digital single market. But uh, it was blocked by, by France. The French government uh, uh, in the final phase came to the conclusion that common market will be risk for French language. For French language. And, uh, and uh, I think that was a fundamental mistake because, because what has been a risk for French language and European languages is, is the fact that there is that kind of American dominance like, like we have today. So it had been good for all European uh, national languages to have a common European platform. And uh, as a consequence, uh, Americans were able to get access to one single market in the United States uh, immediately. 300 million people's market was available for them. In Europe, even Nokia, when trying to create its own applications, uh, Nokia had to, to get license in every single European Union member country. And we, we made the conclusion that, that in many countries it's not reasonable, profitable, to, to make that licensing program because, or process because revenues, potential revenues were less than licensing costs. So, so we had an opportunity to do that, but because of uh, political reasons, unfortunately, we, we failed. Another reason is that, that uh, we have not fully understood in Europe what is the foundation of strength of Europe. We still have a lot of, lot of uh, political decision makers who, who have an idea that we need constitutional foundation, we need some political uh, programs, political processes to, to get Europe uh, strong. I, I don't believe in those. I think the strength of Europe in the future will lie on science, technology and innovation. All those forces in the world who have a, who have a good capacity in science and technology uh, will be powerful or have been powerful and will be powerful in the future as, as well. And in Europe, we have not fully understood that. And I, I hope that this crisis we, we are facing now uh, will, will give a lesson for us and, and the European Commission and uh, EU countries will be clever enough to understand that the 750 billion we are going to spend now, it has to be spent in a way that it will strengthen Europe in the, in the, in the future. I'm optimistic that that will happen, but, but I'm not sure that this is going to be at least 100% 100% uh, result but anyway now there is an opportunity to do that maybe i will say few words about ecosystem and then we have to be closing because we are taking overtime now uh, what what does it mean when we speak when we speak about ecosystem uh, i think good case is is this uh, smartphone case in the Silicon Valley. Why Nokia was losing and why Apple was winning. Uh, we have many uh, 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 analysts in Finland who are saying that in Nokia uh, they were shouting too much and they were not uh, listening to, uh, to, 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 to experts at Nokia. Uh, they were not understanding uh, touchscreen technology and the importance of that and so on and so on. We have a lot of this kind of uh, uh, explanations which are typically, uh, typically uh, 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 taken rather seriously in the, in the debate. 
But to, when looking at this big picture, I think it was very clear. If you look at the ecosystem for mobile phone in the 1990s, that ecosystem was based on R&D spending, access to skills and talents, a certain amount of, 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 of R &D, public R&D resources as well, and then access to, to the market and standards. These, were, these five were the critical factors in, in that ecosystem. That ecosystem was rather simple and Europe was able to have all these criteria there. For example, the United States missed one, maybe only one, but that was a fundamental mistake Americans made. They did not accept one single standard. They expected that when different mobile standards will compete with each other, finally one standard is going to win. And uh, Americans lost that game. So GSM became a global, more or less a global standard and, uh, and winning standard. And that gave huge, huge support for Europeans to, to survive and to succeed and to win in the market. But then, after 2000, quite soon after 2000, software started to become more and more relevant. If a mobile phone uh, was based on, let's say, 80% of the, of the value created was based on hardware and 20% was based on software, when smartphones came, the uh, situation was just the opposite. 80% coming from software and 20%, only 20% from hardware. And uh, look at the list of uh, major software companies in Europe. If you take the 20 biggest software companies in the world, there is one single European company, SAP from Germany. Nothing else. And in Finland as well, we saw that uh, software capacities were not at all uh, on par, far away from par with uh, uh, the Silicon Valley. That was one element, missing element, uh, from European perspective in the new ecosystem, ecosystem of smartphones. But then there was a second element as well, and that was lack of, uh, lack of uh, uh, digital content. In the United States, thanks to the market, they were able to integrate easily all the digital content into smartphones. And Steve Jobs did it uh, in, a, in a perfect way. In Europe, because of the lack of single market, digital single market, we couldn't do that. So the European ecosystem for smartphones was not able to compete with the American one. And later on, also the Chinese one uh, was, uh, and, and Korean ones uh, one were stronger than, than European ones. So we lost because of the lack of right kind of ecosystem. Uh, luckily, we have one good ecosystem left. And by the way, from European perspective, the core of that ecosystem is in Finland. But we don't understand that fully. Bioeconomy ecosystem in Finland is extraordinary. We still have in Finland the best place to develop bioeconomy products and services. But I'm quite sure that very few in our political decision-making system is able to understand what does it mean and how to take maximum benefit from, from that ecosystem. Bioeconomy is, is together with uh, digital uh, solutions, it's the biggest promise we have now uh, for, for the future. And both need strong ecosystems. If you look at uh, Anekoski factory, it's not anymore called, called uh, uh, forest industry factory, but it's bioeconomy factory. Uh, if you look at that, it's based on ecosystem as well. Bio business is ecosystem game as well. And I really hope that uh, when looking at business and society collaboration, this ecosystem thinking is going to be in the core. And ecosystem means that political decision makers, uh, business decision makers, and academic and research decision makers all are integrated or all are operating on the same platform. Even media, in a way, will be there. And if Europe is not able to understand that, I'm afraid we are going to lose between the United States and China. If we are able to understand that and to make right kind of calls, I still believe that Europe has opportunities to, to
to to to not only to survive but also to take take uh, leading role in the in the world. All right, we have uh, spent our time. Uh, unfortunately, we started a bit late and we are concluding a bit late. But uh, I hope that you have got some ideas. What does it mean when we speak about shared value thinking? I am strong believer that Europe, especially can benefit a lot if we really understand what it means and we also understand that the shared value ideas have to be integrated into uh, educational systems as, as well so that both business leaders, academic leaders and governmental political leaders will understand the principles and rules of the game in this ecosystem business in the future. Thank you so much.